everybody. Welcome back to the Edom Factor. Tonight's top story, the Israel-Edomite border crisis. And here to talk with me about that is Barbara. Ed, Barbara, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. So, Barbara, here's what I have to say. Here's the fact of the matter, is that, is that Jacob would never have returned the see, favor see, of... Here, here's the problem. It's, it's Israel now, and, and you know... You're constantly trying to control the narrative by... Listen, they can call themselves whatever they want, but we know for a fact where they came from, and I guarantee, I guarantee you that they would have ransacked us had they been okay, given the chance to do so I as well. See. So because you imagine that they would have done it, this excuses us for be behaving like worse hypothetical Jacobs. Really glad to know where your moral compass is. My moral compass lies in finding what's best for Edom, and oh well, they got hit on their journey around us. Oh, well, we got our share. And you know what? Because we got our share, the value of the Edomite shekel is up 24%. Oh, I understand completely. So because we made a quick goat, this completely excuses us for betraying our brother. <sighs> what a joke this is. Oh, good grief. My brother. I see that propaganda machine that they have over there called Obadiah is really getting to you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, bro, but that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Catch us tomorrow, t tomorrow night on the Edom Factor where we discuss the declining popularity in beef stew in the average Edomite home. Thanks for joining us. You didn't realize we had a breaking news department, did you? <laughs> oh, they did a good job. Hey, good to see you guys. We are we're beginning a new series today entitled Bible Shorts. And if you've ever watched, you may watch YouTube Shorts, right? Or what about Instagram Reels? Anybody watch those? Okay. And so... Um, we're going to be looking at, at, at this idea of Bible shorts over the next few weeks because there are some Bible shorts in the Bible. Um, how many of you knew that there were five one-chapter books in the Bible? There are five one-chapter books of the Bible. I won't ask you to name them. Should I? No. So we have Obadiah, we have Philemon, we have 2 John, 3 John, and then we have the book of Jude. These are like little shorts. They're almost, how many of you guys remember postcards? Anybody remember postcards, right? So these are kind of like postcards. They're small books in the Bible, but they're packed with incredible, incredible information. Now, what I would like for you to do is each week when we're studying these books, we're going to do this over the next six weeks because I'm breaking Obadiah up into two parts this week and next week, but, and then we'll be uh, uh, four weeks after that. So each week, what I would like for you to do is to read each book before you come to church. Can you do that? They're one chapter books, okay? So just to show you how quickly you can do this, I, I read each book this week and I timed myself. Now, I'm not a fast reader. I'm not a slow reader. I'm probably right in between. And so I put these in your notes. They'll be up on the screens so you can see how quickly you can read these books. The book of Obadiah took me two minutes and 39 seconds. So on this book, you have two weeks to read Obadiah. So how many of you can commit to a minute a week, right? Okay, so, so read the book of Obadiah this week or next week. We're gonna do part one this week, part two next week. And then we have the book of Philemon. It took me one minute and 41 seconds to read Philemon. Second John took me a minute and six seconds. Third John took me a minute and 14 seconds. And then Jude, which is the longest one of all, it took me two minutes and 43 seconds. So how many of you have three minutes a week where you can read the Bible, right? Okay, so this is what I'd like you to do over the next six weeks. Get into these books, read these books, maybe read them more than once. You could do it really every day. They all, all of them, each of them take less than three minutes. So I really want to encourage you to read these books. So today we're going to begin with the only Old Testament book that is one chapter, and that is the book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah. And now if you have your phone so you can cheat, it's easy to find, right? It's in the Old Testament. But if you have your physical Bible, it is very easy to miss and easy to, and, and very easy um, to overlook. So Obadiah is sandwiched between Daniel and Jonah. Okay, so you get to Daniel, turn right, turn right. You'll have Daniel, you'll have uh, Hosea, you'll have Joel, you'll have Amos, and then you will get in to 
Obadiah. If you've hit Zechariah, turn back left. You've gone a little too far. Again, it's a small book, one chapter, so it's kind of difficult to find. So there's a few facts about Obadiah that I want to talk about. These are in your notes. You can download our New Hope East Lake app as well and follow along um, under the notes tab of our app. So a couple things about Obadiah. The first fact is this. Obadiah was an Old Testament prophet. So Obadiah is a person. Okay, it's not a place. O Obadiah is a person. Obadiah is a prophet. Now, a prophet's job was to relay a message from God to either individuals or a group of people or, in this sense, a nation. Now, Obadiah, or a prophet, was kind of like a Bluetooth, like a Bluetooth speaker, where they would get their their information from a source, God, and then they would relay that message to the people or an individual. Now, prophets were not always popular because oftentimes they brought bad news. And so people did not like prophets. You ever heard the term like, don't kill the messenger? Well, sometimes this would happen. People did not like prophets because, well, for one, nobody really likes to hear God correcting them, right? That's why so few Christians read their Bibles. We don't really like to see correction or read correction or, or, or deal with any change in our lives. And this is the case with prophets. They would speak from the Lord, which we see right in the beginning of Obadiah, the first two verses, and they would speak to people. And oftentimes it wasn't good news. Most of the time it was not good news. And so Obadiah was a prophet used by God to speak to a specific group of people, which are called the Edomites or Edom, which we'll look at here in just a little bit. Number two, the second fact about the book of Obadiah is very little is known about Obadiah himself as a man. We know a lot about most of the prophets in the Bible. Obadiah, we know next to nothing about. We don't know where he's from. We don't know where he was born. We don't know who his parents were. He appears for just a minute, and then he's gone. It's kind of like, you know, he, he just says what he has to say and then he is gone. We know nothing about Obadiah other than what we have here. His name means servant or worshiper of the Lord. We do know that he was a prophet. So the book of Obadiah, another interesting fact is that book of Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's the shortest book in the Old Testament. Now, how many of you ever heard the term major prophets and minor prophets? Anybody ever heard that term? So Bible scholars, theologians oftentimes will, will refer to specific books in the Old Testament as major prophets or minor prophets. So you have your major prophets prophets, which are books like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ezekiel and Daniel. And then you have your minor prophets um, that books like Joel, Hosea, Amos, Obadiah is one, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So you have your major prophets and then you have your minor prophets, Obadiah being a minor prophet. And you might say, well, what's the difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet? Well, it's very simple. The difference is not significance. The, 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 the difference is not, it's less important. If it was a minor prophet, that book or that prophet was less important. The difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet is just simply length of the book. The major prophets are your larger books of the Bible or your, your larger Old Testament books. And then your minor prophets are small books or small letters. Does that make sense? So you have your major prophets and your minor prophets. Ton, they both have tons of valuable and very important information. It's just simply um, the size of the book, which obviously Obadiah being the smallest book in the Old Testament would fall under the minor prophet section. Now, another interesting thing is that Edom, which is what we're going to look at today, this is the, the place that, um, that Obadiah is bringing this message to, Edom, or the Edomites. This is modern day Jordan, modern day Jordan. Maybe you've heard of the city Petra, which we'll look at here in just a little while. That's Edom. So Obadiah is a prophet. He's pronouncing judgment on a group of people known as the Edomites. And the reason that they're in trouble, this is really important, especially with what's gone on this weekend, is because they were going against God's people. 
They were not helping God's people. They were actually plundering Israel. They're plundering God's people. And it's interesting that I've had this series planned for some time. And today we're talking about, uh, uh, about a, a group of people, a nation that goes against Israel. And what's interesting is what's happened this weekend where Israel has experienced bombings um, over the weekend and are currently being attacked. And the Bible makes it very clear that those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. And so it's always important that we support Israel, that we pray for Israel. Matter of fact, if you've been to Israel, to Jerusalem, there are signs all over that say, pray for peace in Jerusalem or pray for peace of Israel. Because Israel is kind of like a volcano. It can erupt at any time, such as what we've been seeing um, this weekend. And so it's always good to remember to pray for Israel. And as a country, we should always stand and defend the people of Israel. And so the Edomites or Edom was going against Israel. They were taking advantage of Israel. Their Israel's picked on oftentimes and the Edomites were one of them. What makes it worse is that the Edomites were actually family, which we'll look at here um, in just a minute. Now remember, these are real people. These are real situations. This is real history that we see here. So in order to understand who the Edomites were or who Edom was, we have to go all the way back to Abraham. Now we put kind of a family tree in your notes. It'll be up on the screen as well. We gotta go all the way back to Abraham. So Abraham had two sons. This is, this is really important. Because if you under, you've got to understand this to understand the book of Obadiah, because a lot of times we read books and we're like, well, this makes no sense to me, is because the backstory is what makes the context and the content relevant and what makes it easier to understand. So we got to go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Now we know, or you may know, that Ishmael was the firstborn. And, but he's called the son of the flesh because we know that Abraham took matters into his own hands. He was tired of waiting on God. And so he decided to take matters into his own hand. And out of that came Ishmael. Well, Isaac was born in their old age when they thought that they couldn't have kids. God brought about Isaac. Now, Isaac is the chosen child, the promised child. And literally to this day, why we still have conflict in Israel and around Israel, have you ever noticed like Israel is just a little sliver. It's literally a hundred miles wide and 300 miles long. It's very small. Why is there always battles? Why does everybody want the land and places in Israel? Well, this is why right here, because there's a group of people from Ishmael that think that Israel is theirs because Ishmael was the firstborn. But Isaac is the chosen, the promised child, the child of promise. And so there's that battle still to this day on whose land is whose. So from Isaac, Isaac had two sons. Isaac had Esau and Jacob. They were twins. Maybe you know the story. These two were twins. Now, again, this is crazy. It seems crazy to us, but God knows what he's doing. Esau, even though they're twins, came out first. And so he's technically the firstborn. Jacob was second, but God said the, 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 the older would serve the younger. And so even though Esau was born first, Jacob is the chosen child. Jacob is the one chosen to lead the Israelites that God chose. And we know if you read the story in, uh, in the book of Genesis, that when they were coming out of the womb, Jacob grabbed the heel of Esau. There is this, this, this battle ensued with them. And we know this, that when they were born, that Esau, Esau was more of a leader. Esau was more of a man's man. He was rugged. He liked to hunt. He was an outdoorsman. He was more like his dad. He was, he was kind of favored by his dad. So you would think that he would be the natural leader of the Israelites. But God said, no, I've chosen Jacob to be the leader. Leader 
Jacob was more of an indoor kid. Video games, computers, like to cook, art, poetry. He's more like his mom, so he is favored like his mom. And so because Jacob wasn't rough and tough, can you keep that up there, please? Because he wasn't rough and tough and he wasn't like Esau, he wasn't much of a leader, Jacob had to scheme his way to the top, which is what he's known for. And we know that when Esau one time, he went out hunting, he came back, he was famished, he was starving, and Jacob had this bowl of soup, and he's like, do you want this soup? And he's like, oh, I'm starving, I'll eat anything. And he's like, okay, give me your birthright. And he's like, I don't care, whatever, just give me food. And so he traded his birthright to get this soup. And we also know that a little bit later when their father, when Isaac got older, he couldn't see as well, that Jacob, when Esau was away, schemed his way as well to get the blessing of the firstborn. Now this is vital because the firstborn in biblical times, they were the successor. The firstborn male was the successor. The firstborn male received the majority of the inheritance. And so Jacob had tricked his father, even disguised himself into getting the blessing of the firstborn. So when Esau got back, what do you think happened? Esau was ticked off that his blessing from his father had been taken away, even though this was all a part of God's plan. And so this ensued a battle between Jacob and Esau, kind of like Isaac and Ishmael. There's this battle with Jacob and Esau, so much so that Esau was going to kill his brother. And so they had to be separated. So Esau was exiled and he developed or he led a group, his descendants were called the Edomites. And Jacob was the leader of the Israelites. And so we have Esau and Jacob, Jacob the Israelites, Esau the Edomites. So you go from two feuding brothers to now you have two feuding nations. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so that gets us in to where we're at in the book of Obadiah. So let's read, we're going to read the first nine verses and then we're going to finish up Obadiah next week. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God, condemning Edom. This is the job of a prophet. It's not what I'm telling you. It's not what I think. It's not what my agenda. This is from the Lord. And so he makes it very clear. Thus says the Lord. That's what a prophet did. Thus said the Lord. We have heard a report from the Lord. In other words, I've downloaded this from God. God has given this to me. And an envoy has been sent among the nation saying, arise and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small amongst the nations. Now here's the key. You, if you want to circle something, if you want to highlight something, verse three is the key to this entire book. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling places, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you've built high like the eagle, Though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how will you be ruined? Would they not steal only until they have enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some for gleanings? In other words, when places are ransacked or when enemies come to take out a nation or a country. They don't take everything. Like they take what they can and then they leave. But Obadiah says, everything is going to be stripped. Everything from every nook and cranny, everything you've hidden, nothing will be left over. Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasure searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. In other words, even your allies, even the alliances you have are gonna turn against you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush against you for there is no understanding in him. Will I not in that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman. 
so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. So the title of my message today is Pride is Nothing to be Proud of. Pride is a serious sin in the Bible. It is a very serious sin in the Bible. Now, the reason why the Edomites were so proud, what we see in verse three, nobody can take us down, nobody can defeat us, is because of the really the brilliance of their geographical location. I've got some pictures, I've been here, it's amazing, on what they did. So they built their nation, they built their people, built their population in rocks up in the mountains. And look how beautiful it is. If you've ever uh, seen, what is it, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they're going through the thing and they come to this, you know, to the, that chosen city or whatever, it was in Edom. And, and so it's just beautiful. Look how ornate and detailed the outside were. But at the inside, they're bu it's built into literally the mountain, into the rock. And so we got another picture as well. I mean, just gorgeous. You can see how they built these ornate, you know, uh, homes in to the rocks. Now, what's interesting about Edom is they were so strategic and how they built it, it was literally impossible to penetrate, to defeat them. And the reason why is this, there was literally a path that led into Petra that was difficult to get to. We, I, I, I have a video here that I can show you guys. So literally part, most parts of this way to get into Edom was about 15 feet wide. Now there were parts that, that were wider, but most of it was 15 feet, around 15 feet wide, hundreds of feet high for a mile. And so think about this. If you're gonna attack Edom, it really doesn't matter how big your army is. So even if they have, even if they are outmanned, you have to attack Edom in a single file line, basically. You can't fit your ch chariots through there. You can't fit your artillery through there. There's nothing you can do. You literally have to stand shoulder by shoulder in a lot of parts just to get in there for a mile. And so not only would they not know you're coming for a long ways, but even if you had millions of people in your army, you literally had to go through this narrow corridor. And what they would do is they would just pick you off one by one. It is said that 12 men 12 men could guard the entire city. Isn't that amazing? So no wonder they were so arrogant and they were so full of pride. They're like, we have our, our city up in the stars. Who can ever defeat us? Who could ever? Nobody could defeat them. You couldn't get to them. Usually in those days, the bigger the army, that's the nation that won. But not here. Didn't matter how, how big your army was, you can only funnel so many through this narrow corridor, it really didn't matter how big your army was. Pride. Verse three tells us this mindset that they had, the, the arrogance of your heart. So maybe they didn't say it out loud, but the Lord knows the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. This is the way they thought. This was their mindset. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling places, who say in your heart, who will ever bring us down? And God says, even though you build as high as an eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, how can you go higher than God, right? And so they were so confident, and it really was a brilliant plan, the way they designed the city, it's really incredible. Proverbs 16, 18, it's in your notes. The Bible says that pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Better to live humbly with the poor than to share plunder with the proud. We know that this is what, this sin of pride is what casts Lucifer out of heaven. Matter of fact, Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the SARS. Does it sound familiar with what we see with Edom? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God and I will sit on the mountain of congregation in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. It, it sounds familiar with what the Edomites were saying as well. And we know because of this pride, Lucifer was cast out of heaven along with a third of the angels as well. Modern psychologists tell us 
that there are two emotions when it comes to pride. And they split it into two categories. One is authentic pride, and then there's hubristic pride. Authentic pride is feeling confident and competent in who you are. Hubristic pride, or this excess pride, is letting ego, e egocentrism and arrogance take over, like what we see here in this text. Excessive pride is an exaggerated appreciation of oneself by devaluing other people, basically making everybody competition or everybody a competitor. C.S. Lewis said that true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And so feeling proud is not the same as being proud. Does that make sense? The Edomites were not just confident, they were proud and God took notice. Obadiah tells them that they've been deceived. You see why prophets were not very popular? Obadiah is telling these people that they've been deceived by their own pride. And as a result, God would bring them down and they would be destroyed. There's two significant problems with the Edomites. And as we look at these, because the Bible is so relevant to our lives, we always need to look at ourselves. The Bible's kind of like a mirror, right? We always need to look at ourselves. This is written specifically to a group of people, but there are definitely some takeaways that we can look at in our lives. There are two significant problems with the Edomites, and if we're not careful, we'll fall into that same sin. The first one is this, is that the Edomites, they trusted in themselves more than God. Verse three, it says that you've been deceived by your own pride. They separated themselves from God's people. They believed in themselves, in their own power. They were flourishing. And so why would they ever need God? Matter of fact, if you go all the way back to when Moses had delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, this is a crazy story. This goes all the way back that Moses had requested that as a part of their escape, they go through Edom, their family, their distant cousins, right? But the Edomites would not allow God's people to come through and God remembered. And so this is part of the judgment as well. We'll look more into this next week into why God is so upset with what the Edomites did and what they were doing. The Edomites did not help the children of Israel and we'll look further into that next week. You see, the temptation for us is that when we experience some success in any area of our life, we have a natural tendency to become less dependent upon God. And so we see this with the Edomites. They trusted in themselves more than they trusted God. Who can ever take us down? Who could ever penetrate our boundaries? Who could ever defeat us? I mean, we have this strategic advantage. We have this geographical advantage. We have this military advantage. I mean, 12 of us can take out an army of a million. I mean, pride had filled their hearts. And in areas oftentimes where we experience some success, we have a tendency to be less dependent upon God. Now think about this. When is the last time you've had to pray and ask God for something to eat? Where you've been so starving and so malnourished that you need food, you need God to provide food. What about a place to live? What about clothing? God, I have nothing unless you provide for me. Odds are none of us in this room have been in a position where we've had to literally pray and ask the Lord for that. Now we shouldn't feel guilty for that, but we should also not feel independent of God. We should be thankful, grateful for it and use what God's blessed us with to be a blessing to other people. I say this all the time that there are people all over the world that when they wake up, they beg and pray to God for the things that we wake up to and we don't even have to think about. Again, we should not feel ashamed or feel bad or guilty for that, but we should keep things in perspective and be thankful. That's why at my house, before we eat, we pray every single time, God, thank you for the food that you provide. 
Help me to not be so dependent upon my gifts and what you've given me and what I have to replace my dependence upon you. And we definitely see that here with the Edomites. They were so prideful and they were so satisfied with where they were at and what they had built and what they had done. They completely abandoned any dependence upon God whatsoever. Matter of fact, they just went through life and did whatever they wanted to do. They knew that they were supposed to be protectors of Israel, but they're like, nah, we'll do whatever we want and build our own kingdom for ourselves. We're gonna hold that grudge and do what we wanna do. So not only did they trust in themselves more than they trusted in God. Number two, they trusted in their own resources more than they trusted in God. Their geographical location, which was brilliant by the way, their rocks, their military, their allies, their fortresses, they placed their faith in their resources rather than in God's resources. The second part of verse three says, because you live in a rock fortress and you make your home high in the mountains, and you say, who can ever reach us up here anyways? You ask boastfully. All of their assurance, all of their security was in their own resources and not in God. It's interesting that there's a church in the New Testament that Jesus writes a letter to. It's known as the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter three. They had this self-assured dependence as well. We don't need anything else. We have everything we need. We don't even need God. I mean, we got everything. Look what we've built. We're rich, we're wealthy, we have everything. We don't need God. And Jesus said to them, because you say I am rich and I become wealthy and I have need of nothing. Jesus said, you, you don't know, you don't even get it. You have no self-awareness at all. You value things that I don't value. What's important to you may not be important to me. He said, but you are wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. They thought they had it all. They thought they'd achieved the pinnacle of success. But Jesus says, I know your hearts. And while we judge what we have on the outside, Jesus knows what we have on the inside. Just like Esau would not humble himself and submit to God's plan, even though he was the firstborn, that wasn't God's plan. Just like Esau would not submit and it began this battle, his people followed down the same path and it would lead to their downfall. We'll look more, more about, we'll look at that Sunday, exactly what happened and, 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 and why they are in such trouble. Matter of fact, it's interesting, the Edomites no longer exist. The city of Petra is basically a tourist attraction. So let's wrap up with two lessons that we can learn from this story. The first one is this, life can change quickly. Boy, don't we know it. A diagnosis, a phone call, a company layoff, divorce papers, mergers, things can change quickly. We know that. Just because everything's good today, doesn't mean that everything's gonna be good tomorrow. The Edomites thought that they could never be defeated. They were depending upon things that were not meant to last. And that could be a problem for us as well oftentimes. When all of our confidence is in the things that the world provides, we're not guaranteed those things tomorrow. One minute the Edomites are literally on top of the world, but God tells them, that because of their arrogance, their disobedience, their pride, that their reign would not last. We all have experienced storms in our life, and if you haven't, you will. The storms come in all of our lives. And the Bible tells us that we can build our life on ourselves, or we can build our life on, on, on God. Those that build their lives on the Lord, they build their lives on a rock foundation. And those that build lives on their stuff or on themselves, build their life on a foundation of sand. And when the storms and the winds and the rains come, the houses that are built on the rock, those are the ones that can withstand. That doesn't mean that they don't go through storms. Both go through storms. But the ones that make it through to the other side are the ones that are not dependent upon the things that the things that the world sees as important, but we built our trust and our faith in the Lord. 
The second takeaway from this story is not only can things change quickly and Edom would find this out, we'll look next week at that, but number two, the second lesson we can take away from this is that God's plan will not always make sense to us. How many of you have ever experienced that where God asks you to do something and you're like, this makes no sense. But looking back, you're like, oh, God is actually smarter than me, right? Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah, I think we all have experienced that. If our obedience is contingent upon God having to explain himself, or if our obedience is contingent upon whether it makes logical sense, then that's going to be a problem. God choosing Jacob instead of Esau did not make cultural sense, nor did it even make logical sense. It didn't make common sense. Jacob was weak. Jacob was timid. Esau was rough and tough. He was more of a leader. It would have made more sense. Plus, he was the firstborn. It would have made more sense for him to be the leader. So why would God choose the weaker over the one who was stronger? Because God's ways are not our ways. And God knows things that we don't know. And God sees things that we don't see. Sometimes God does things that according to the world or even logical sense might seem foolish to us. Like we talked about a couple weeks ago when it comes to generosity, when it comes to giving. A lot of times what makes logical sense is the more I give, the more I lose. But the Bible says, no, the more we give, the more we get. It doesn't make sense that I can live better off the 90% that God blesses than the 100% that I hoard all for myself. It makes no logical sense. But there's always the God factor, right? Everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. What about this? The Bible tells us to love our enemy, to pray for those who curse us. I mean, that makes no sense. We want to get back. We want to take revenge. Yet the Bible tells us to bless those who curse us, to love those and to serve those that despitefully use us. This makes no sense from a humanistic standpoint, but God's laws supersede what might not make sense to us. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says that God chose things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise and that he chooses things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. And God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considered important. Why? Because God gets the credit and not us. God has a way of taking the things that we would say there's no way God can do this, and yet he does. Things didn't have to be this way for Esau or for the Edomites, but because they allowed their excessive pride to drive them, instead of submitting to God's plan, they decided to live independently of God, and it led to their destruction. You see, if, only, if we only obey God, or listen to God when things make sense to us, then we'll never walk by faith. And the Bible tells us that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Next Sunday, we'll finish out the book of Obadiah and all of you are gonna read it, right? And the message next week will be called what goes around comes around. It's kind of the boomerang effect. And you might not realize that this term, kind of the, the karma, what goes around comes around, it actually originates in the Bible. And we'll look at that um, um, next week. So I wanna close with a couple of things. One, let's make sure that we're dependent upon the Lord and not in ourselves or our resources. Number two, I want us to pray for some people in our church for some of you, it's been a really difficult year. Um, for some of us, recently, it's been a, re uh, uh, a really difficult week or difficult month. Um, we just lost Dorcas Taggart, who went to be with the Lord. We'll have her services. She's a longtime member here at New Hope. We'll have her services this Wednesday. Teresa Chang went to be with the Lord, a dear lady that went to New Hope here. I did her service just a couple weeks ago as well. Our kids director, Brooke Price, and her sister, Kelly, they just lost their father, Mitch, this past week as well. And our sweet, dear, beautiful young lady, Melody, that we've been praying over, that God would heal the cancer diagnosis that she had been, um, that had had, went to be with the Lord as well. 
And so listen, listen, listen. When we pray, we pray God's will be done. And again, things might not always make sense to us, right? But God's got a plan. And I know there's some of you have been through some loss this year. I know that. You've been through some difficulties and it doesn't always make sense. And sometimes we're scratching our head. Why would this happen? But God knows things we don't know. That's why it's so important that we place our trust not in our own intellectual abilities, even our own talents, even our own brilliance or in our stuff or the things that we have, but we place our faith in that solid rock in the Lord because things are gonna happen that don't make sense to us. But God always has a plan. God's always in control and God always knows what's best. We can never be in better hands than the hands of the Lord. And thank God that this life is not the end. The Bible says we don't mourn like people that have no hope because we have hope beyond this life. Father, thank you so much for your blessings. Lord, we lift up so many people in our church that this year has been a difficult year. We've had some losses, some struggles, health issues. And Father, I'm, I'm thinking of the families and we're praying together as a church for these families that have suffered loss. But Father, for us, we're saying goodbye, but on your side, you're saying welcome. And Father, thank you so much that we have hope beyond this life. And I just pray that you give peace to those that need peace, strength to those that need strength, comfort to those that need comfort and help them to trust in you more than ever before, Father. And God, I pray for a sin that can so easily deceive us and that's the sin of pride because oftentimes when we're prideful, we're not very self-aware. And Father, help us to be completely dependent upon you. And I know it's hard when we have a lot, it's hard. But God, help us to wake up each day and know that the air that we breathe, the breath that we have, the things that we wake up to, the family that surrounds us, the food that we eat, the clothes that we put on is a gift and a blessing from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in to New Hope this week. You know, the church doesn't stop when the video does. And make sure that you share this with a friend. You can even support what we're doing via the Give button here on the left. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single Sunday. And we cannot wait to see you this week, either in person or online. Have a great day.